morning. We welcome you once again to our Golden Lampstand online service. Uh, we thank God for the privilege of preparing another video. We thank God for another wonderful week. We thank God for His presence with us. And we thank God uh, that you can join us once again this week. Let me read to you Revelation chapter 4, verses 2, verse 3, uh, part of verse 8 and verse 11 as our call to worship this morning. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. What a wonderful and pleasant sight for John to be able to behold the glory and the majesty of the Almighty. God is beautiful and is beyond description. And the angels say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor, power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So let's come before God in prayer and let's worship God for the marvelous, great, and beautiful God whom He is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you because you are beautiful and you are beautiful beyond description. How marvelous, how great, how wonderful the sight. So we thank you, we praise you and even today we come before you in praise, in worship, in thanksgiving to honor you, to exalt you as the Lord our God and to worship you at your throne. We thank you and we praise you, we plead to you this morning, speak to us, minister to our hearts, and even as we humbly offer this worship to you, let it be a sweet-smelling incense that goes before your throne. In the Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
Collector's Prayer, Luke 18, 9 to 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you that your word always speaks into our hearts. And today, even as we look at the lives of this tax collector and the Pharisee, we pray that once again your word will enlighten us. Once again, your word will speak into our hearts. And we pray that your spoken word into our hearts will transform our lives. In the Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Firstly, I'd like to apologize that this would only be an audio message due to a technical problem with the computer. Today we want to look at the tax collector's prayer. The Lord Jesus Christ said a parable and the parable was basically about two people who went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The word of God says that the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. 
He said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. He spoke about robbers, evildoers, adulterers. And then he even spoke about the tax collector who was there. And he said, I'm not even like this tax collector. And then he spoke about what he did. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. Then the Lord drew his attention to the tax collector and he said the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Uh, and then the conclusion was uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God. And then the Lord Jesus Christ concluded for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, I want to start off by saying that this parable was most possibly spoken in a context where there were many people uh, present. It was not spoken just to the disciples or uh, to the twelve or the apostles, it was. Uh, it seems it gives us an impression that they were either a collective of discourses that the Lord had spoken, or it seems that this would have been a parable that he said as he was on this journey from chapter seventeen into Jerusalem, and along the way he was visiting some villages, and it happened during that time because in this parable. Uh, in this general context of this situation, we see the sick, we see the Pharisees, uh, we see later parents coming with children, uh, and then there was a rich ruler who came to the Lord, and it seems that there were many people around. The reason why I am highlighting the audience is because I believe that this issue involves everybody and not only the church. It, it involves the leadership of the church, it involves the pastoral team, but it also involves every believer in the church from the oldest to the youngest to richest to the poorest and it also involves people who are outside the church because we all are confident about certain things quite often our relationship with god and we all love to put other people down now the context is basically when the Lord Jesus Christ saw people being confident with their righteousness and when he saw them looking down on other people, he spoke this parable. So the subject matter of this parable is people who were confident of their own righteousness. So I believe it speaks about us because we are often very confident in our righteousness and in our confidence, we tend to look down on other people or sometimes we are confident about our relationship with God or we are confident that we can come into the presence of God and uh, this confidence is based on what we do. It's based on our actions and uh, what we consider our actions to be righteous. So the moral of this parable is in verse 14, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now I want to make a clarification here. And the clarification is this. This parable is not primarily directed to prayer. It was directed to people who were believing in their self-righteousness. But the Lord Jesus Christ related it to prayer. Although the Lord Jesus Christ used prayer as an illustration in this parable, uh, he was not teaching about prayer here. And I would like to say a little bit about that later. Now Luke chapter 18 verses 1 to 8, the parable that the Lord Jesus Christ said before this was a parable that was directed directly to prayer where the Lord Jesus Christ said uh, that it was a parable to show the disciples that they should pray and not give up. And I believe that the meaning of this parable is don't think yourself as so spiritual because God may not think of you as spiritual as you think you are. When God looks at us, He may not look at us the way we look at ourselves. And very often, uh, we find that we tend to think that we are very spiritual. Everybody believes they are spiritual. 
uh, even the man who is on the street, a man who is living in the sin. I remember in the 90s, early 90s, I was sent to do uh, uh, my internship with, with Malaysian Care under the drug prison services. And one of the things I realized when I was there is uh, even those who live on the street, who, the, those who are drug dependents, those who, who sell their bodies, the, the prostitutes who sell their bodies on the street, when you go and share with them and when you, you speak to them, they tend to believe that they are very spiritual. And uh, quite often they tend to think that their understanding of God is deeper than yours and therefore they are more uh, spiritual than the, than than we are, uh, but uh, but it happens to all of us because we all think that we are spiritual. Uh, so uh, the Lord Jesus Christ clearly says that uh, what we do doesn't make us spiritual, and uh, we will come back to that. My interest in this parable is the element of prayer and I, I'm particularly interested in this parable because it speaks about prayer and I would like to share with you four general comments about this parable. The first comment that I would like to make is that the Lord spoke about who was being justified in this parable. If we look at Luke chapter 18 verse 9, he said, to some who were confident of their own righteousness, He's speaking about those who are confident in their righteousness, meaning that they felt that their righteousness was sufficient to give them justification before God. And so the parable speaks about justification. And the Lord Jesus Christ said uh, that who went home justified that day. And he's speaking about justification. So the parable is speaking about justification, but he also mentioned about prayer. And so I would like to start off by making this comment, justification and prayer are interrelated because justification and prayer are about coming into his presence. Now, the word used for justification here, dikaio, uh, basically it means to be rendered just or innocent or simply it, makes, it, it means to be righteous. It means to be righteous. And and it means to be righteous to come into God's presence. Prayer is coming into the presence of God for favor. And uh, justification is coming into God's presence. Let me read to you Romans 5, 1 and 2. Romans 5, 1 and 2 before I explain further. Romans 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace in which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope of glory. So it speaks about we have gained access by faith into His grace. Justification is about gaining access by faith into His grace. Gaining access by um, faith into His presence. So eternal life is being in the presence of God eternally and prayer is coming into the presence of God daily. Let me repeat that. Eternal life is being in the presence of God eternally and prayer is coming into the presence of God daily. So if we want to go to heaven, heaven is about being in God's presence. And when we want to pray, it's about coming into His presence. And uh, that is basically the relationship between justification and prayer. And so that's the first comment that I would like to make. That the Lord Jesus Christ equated the two when He mentioned this parable. He spoke about people who felt righteous before God and justified and he gave prayer as an illustration. The second comment that I would like to make is through this parable we clearly see that human righteousness cannot get us this access. We cannot 
access into the presence of God by our human righteousness. And only Christ can bring us into that presence. And as we mentioned, Romans chapter 5, it says that we gain access by faith into His grace. So it is only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that we can get into His presence, that we can have this access. The Pharisee spoke about the good things he did. He said, I thank you that I'm not a robber, an evildoer, an adulterer, or even a tax collector. He was basically telling God, God, I obey the law. And then he said that I, I, I fast twice a week. I am spiritual. And then he said that I give a tenth of all I get. I tithe. I am obedient. Uh, but these things did not qualify him to go into God's presence. Uh, we all are familiar with Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23, we are very familiar with this verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and we know that our righteousness, even though we think it's righteous before God, it's still contaminated with sin. And the word of God tells us that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given unto men by which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 12, where it says that, that, that if we want to come in God's presence, righteousness cannot help us, but it is only the Lord Jesus Christ who can help us. And no matter how righteous we think we are, our righteousness will not help us. And we are so familiar with John chapter 3, verse 16. Uh, but let's look at John 3, 14. It says that just as Moses lifted the, up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that it, everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. That we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have eternal life, we have salvation. Or, in other words, by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have access into His presence. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.17 For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. So, the Word of God clearly tells us that in order to go into God's presence, we can only achieve that through the Lord Jesus Christ because it is only the righteousness that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ that makes us righteous enough to go into His presence. In the same way, being justified in order for us to go into heaven, when we die, we need the righteousness that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that can give us that access into heaven. So the second observation that we must be clear about is that our own righteousness is not righteous enough to take us into heaven. And that is the sole reason the Lord Jesus Christ came and He died on the cross. Similarly, our righteousness is not good enough to bring us into that place of prayer where we can stand in the presence of God being holy and uh, being righteous and being able to have access into the presence of the Almighty. So that's the second observation that I would like to make. The third observation that I would like to make is just as uh, righteousness doesn't take us into the presence of God, on the contrary, sin destroys our access into God's presence. And the problem with this Pharisee was he was self-righteous and in his self-righteousness there was pride, there was arrogance, he was judgmental and many other things within him. Now let me read to you Matthew 23 verse 25 to 28. It says, Woe to you teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Verse 26, blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside also will be clean. 
Verse 27, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tomb, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. Matthew 23, 28, In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Now, the word of God says that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about the Pharisees and they thought that external appearances and words, wonderful, beautiful words, gave them an accent in, into God's presence. Just because we say we are righteous doesn't make us righteous. Just because we pretend we are righteous doesn't make us righteous. Uh, just because we have those flowery spiritual words, it doesn't make us righteous. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Because he said, when God looks at us, he looks at our hearts. And he looks at the inside as well as the outside. And very often, we tend to pretend on the outside and we think that our pretense qualifies us for righteousness. But he said that when God looked at the Pharisees, he saw that their inside, the heart was just as bad as everybody else. And that's uh, one very important thing that we need to understand, that God is interested on the inside because the inside gives us a true picture of who we are. And no matter how much we pretend to be righteous on the outside, God is interested on the true righteousness that is within us. And that's why the Sermon on the Mount, as we look at Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7, he says that there, there are things that, we do on the inside. He says you may not look at a, a woman lustfully on the outside, but you may, may have thought about her in your heart. You may not have killed someone outwardly, but you may, may have thought about killing in your heart. And he says that all these desires, this evil wickedness that is within us is just as bad as us doing these things on the outside. So the Lord is all the more interested on our inside and so uh, what we need to note here is that when we harbor sin within ourselves our sin destroys our access into god's presence and let me read to you isaiah chapter 1 verse 15 and 16 when you spread out your hands in prayer i will hide my eyes from you even if you offer many prayers i will not listen your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. When God sees our evil deeds, when, when we, we do evil deeds and, and God uh, sees the evil that's within our heart, the evil that we have uh, committed with our hands, He hides His eyes from us and He will not listen to our prayers and and we see that in in the bible uh, when saul in in first samuel chapter 28 uh, when he saw the the philistine army and and he went to inquire of the lord and he asked the lord and and the word of god says that god did not answer him in verse 15 saul says the philistines are fighting against me and god is turned away from me he no longer answers me either by prophets or by dreams so i've called on you so he he calls the spirit of samuel back to tell him what to do what i would like to highlight here is the fact that our sins draw us away from god our sins hinder our prayers from coming to God. And uh, David prayed after he committed his sin with Bathsheba in Psalm 15, 1 verse 11, a very famous psalm. He says, Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, Hosea 7, 2 says, But they do not realize that I remember all their evil deeds, their sins engulf them. They are always before me. So the third thing I want to share with you, or the third observation that we want to make today, is that sin destroys our access into His presence. Sin destroys our access into His presence. So we need to keep away from sin. If we want to live in His presence, if we want to come in, into his presence and the, the final observation which I would like to make is that God is looking for humility and brokenness 
Again, let's look at Psalm 51, the psalm that David prayed when he had sinned against Bathsheba. Uh, psalm 51, verse 16, he says, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring them. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. Uh, verse 17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. So the Lord is looking for brokenness. The Lord is looking for us to come before him with humility, to, to be able to see us as we are. And, and we see examples in the Bible. We see Peter, when, when Peter experienced the first miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he saw what the Lord could do, he said, depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Then we have people like Isaiah who, who stood before God. When God gave him the vision, he said, uh, I'm a man of unclean lips. So we see that every one of these people were, uh, and many others, uh, came before God in brokenness. They, they realized who they really were. They, they could actually see uh, the sins within them. So I would like to uh, say that we need to reflect upon the evil that's within us, come before God in brokenness, confess our sins and ask God to remove this sin and ask God to have mercy upon us that we may once again have that fellowship with God. Ezekiel 18.32 I've shared this many times before. God says, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, but repent and live. God says that it, it doesn't pleasure me to, to destroy people who are sinful, but I want them to turn and come back to me. Ezekiel 33, 11, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? So we see God wants us to be broken. God wants us to realize how wretched we are. God wants us to acknowledge our sins and come before Him pleading for grace, pleading for mercy, pleading for forgiveness. And, and 1 John 1 9 says, And if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and He will forgive our sins. He will pour His precious blood upon us and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness, that we may stand before Him pure and holy. And as we stand before Him pure and holy, we may have access into his presence. And we see that even the evil kings like King Ahab, First King 21, 27, when Ahab heard his words, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. So even an evil king like King Ahab, when he humbled himself, when he came before God broken, God was willing to forgive him and God was willing to remove the disaster that was to come upon him. We see King Manasseh, another very evil, wicked king. It says in Second Chronicles 33, it says that in his distress, Manasseh sought the favor of the Lord. Uh, and it says Manasseh humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And when he prayed to him, in verse 13, when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. So my fourth point, my fourth observation is that God is looking for humility and brokenness. And let me uh, quickly uh, summarize the four things that I have just mentioned to you. Uh, the first thing we must realize that uh, prayer is about coming into the presence of God and justification is also coming into the presence of God. It's access into His presence. So just as we receive eternal life, we come into God's presence and we know that we have salvation, uh, prayer is also coming into the presence of God. And I mentioned that eternal life is being in the presence of God eternally and prayer is coming into the presence of God daily or regularly. The second thing is that human righteousness cannot get us this access. Only Christ can. We, we cannot come into God's presence whether uh, eternally or in prayer 
uh, on our own righteousness. There's no way we can access into the holy presence of God uh, by our own righteousness because ultimately our righteousness is not righteousness before God. Our righteousness is still mixed with all kinds of sinful desires. And even as we looked at the, the Pharisee, we see that his righteousness was a righteousness that, that was filled with pride. It was filled with arrogance. It was it's filled with um, uh, judgmental uh, thoughts. So our righteousness cannot get us access into God's presence. Only Christ can. And the word of God says salvation is found in no one else. There's no one else who can give us the access. There's no other name under heaven given unto us by which we shall be saved. There's no other name under heaven given to us by which we can have that access into God's presence. And the third thing I shared with you is that sin destroys our access into His presence. Whenever we sin, then uh, the word of God says that God will hide his eyes from us. He will not listen to our prayers because God detests sin and a holy God doesn't like to see his children uh, sin. And my fourth point is God requires, God is looking for us uh, for humility and brokenness. And whenever we come before God in brokenness, whenever we come in God in humility, whenever we come before God acknowledging our sin and confessing our sin, we have access into that presence because God by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is able to wash away that sin and make us righteous and holy and come into his presence and uh, I would like to just conclude by saying that uh, in his presence is where we belong we belong in the presence of God and uh, as people of God one of the things that we must do is we must regularly come into his presence because we are people of his presence we must live in God's a present. And um, just before I end this sermon uh, with prayer, I would just like you to look at this short video clip. They're all Jews. How can they live with themselves? Our own people working for Rome. These people make me sick. Collaborators, let's move on. A stinking vermin. You should keep your distance from them. Two men went to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and the other one. tax collector. The Pharisee prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, thieves, adulterers, or this tax collector. But the tax collector He didn't even look up to heaven. He said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. God bless the tax collector. Not the Pharisee. Anyone who praises himself for be humbled. And anyone who humbles himself will be praised. Matthew, come. No 
how he even caused the sinners to follow him. One has to wonder of the sins committed by his other followers. Father, we thank you because of your great love for us. We thank you that you have sent your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us, that because of his death and because of his righteousness, we can freely come into your holy presence and have access into your holiness. We want to pray that you teach us to stay away from sin. We want to pray that you also teach us to come before you searching our hearts every time, knowing that even within us, even our every thought, even our every inclination, they are all sins before you. Our desires are sins before you. So we want to pray that every time we come before you, grant us a heart that is full of repentance, a heart that approaches your throne in brokenness. And we want to pray that you yourself will show favor upon us. We want to pray that we will be justified and that our prayer would be heard by you and that you will take heed to the prayers that we plead to you. We thank you and we praise you. Bless us today even as we discover how to come into your presence every day. In the Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The benediction, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessings of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forevermore. Thank you for joining us once again at our Golden Lampstand online service. We apologize for the technical problem that we had uh, during the sermon. Uh, we hope to get it sorted out before next week. Uh, thank you and have a blessed week.